Okay, so continuing here with part two of 21 from Pontius Pilate. Pilate knew that the uncanny darkness at the time of the crucifixion had covered all of, all of a, a Palestine, but he was absolutely astounded that it had also penetrated as far as Rome. He had always disliked Thrasyllus, and the astrologer knew it, which is why he carefully included the remark about the emperor sharing his concern. Whether it was true or not, Pilate could not afford to guess, but it was common knowledge that Tiberius now spent much of his time on his astro astro astrological hobby in the uppermost of his lavish villas on Capri, where he'd finished an occult observatory. Two, Thrasyllus's granddaughter had married the new Praetorian prefect, Macro. The letter would have to be answered. After consulting Caesarius, one astrologer, Pilate replied to Thrasyllus, apologizing that he had not written sooner. Yes, he had learned a little bit about the star. Gratus, his predecessor, told him it had attracted some Eastern Magi to Jerusalem who were looking for a king of the Jews, but they had been referred to a nearby town instead. If he wanted more details, he could consult Gratus in Rome since the Jerusalem priests remembered little of the event. But the local astrologer simply could not explain it. An earth tremor had accompanied the darkness, but the event remained a total mystery. Pilate thought of mentioning the coincidence of the darkness with the crucifixion of another king of the Jews, but he rejected the idea. With his astrologer's mind, Thrasyllus would surely belabor the coincidence. The question of whether he ought to submit to Tiberius a special detailed report on the crucifixion of Jesus had occurred to Pilate. It would demonstrate both his obedience to the imperial directive that he that that he honor Jewish laws and also his loyalty in crucifying someone who dared call himself a king while Tiberius lived. On the other hand, in now metaphysical frame of mind, the princeps might become unduly interested in a religious luminary who had called himself a son of God, and he might even criticize Pilate for condemning him. Conversely, in a paranoid twist, Tiberius might suspect a great Eastern conspiracy against him and punish Pilate for not rounding up and crucifying the entire following of the would-be king, rather than just the ringleader. Better to let sleeping dogs lie. Legally, of course, he would have to include some notice of Jesus' execution in his official acta or annual report, which he submitted to Tiberius. When he drew this up to the close, drew this up at the close of the year 33, the following extracts appeared in Pilate's acta under the, the section entitled Judiciary Acts. Jesus, age 38 and 41, respectively, both highway robbers convicted of theft and mur murder, penetrated Jericho and Jerusalem on March 26. Um, five eyewitnesses among Galilean pilgrims attending the Passover festival in Jerusalem tried on April 2, crucified and died on April 3. And then we've got Barabbas, son of a rabbi, resistance leader, accused of murder and insurrection, but released prior to the trial. As requested by the great Sanhedrin and the citizens of Jerusalem by reason of the annual Passover amnesty, and then Jesus, age 36, um, Galilean teacher, quote-unquote prophet, and pseudo-messiah. Case was remanded to the jurisdiction of the Tetrarch Herod Antipas, who waived his authority and returned the defendant for Roman trial, convicted of capital blasphemy by the great Sanhedrin, with verdict endorsed by the prefect. Also convicted of constructive treason for claiming to be Rex Ludonorum, accusatories, Joseph Caiaphas, high priest, and the great Sanhedrin. Tried, sentenced, crucified, and died on April 3, 786 in Jerusalem. So that was his note that he wrote. During the early months of 34, domestic affairs seemed to be running smoothly in Palestine. Pilate's truce with the Herodian Tetrarchs was holding rather well, and there was no threatening correspondence from Rome. But death now staged a dramatic interruption in cutting down the popular Tetrarch Philip, who had married his dancing niece Salome. Since Philip left no children, so Philip died, Herod Antipas was hoping the emperor might award his Tetrarchy to him, which would double the lands under his control. Um, but instead, Philip's territory was attached to the province of Syria. The time had come for Pilate to see if either his Syrian or Egyptian fences needed mending. To the north, the four Roman legions in Syria stood especially high in Tiberius' favor, since they alone had not hung images of Sejanus among their military standards, and the emperor had rewarded them handsomely for this prudent gesture. The recently arrived commander of these now elite forces, Pomp Pomponius Flaccus, represented a new quantum of power on Pilate's horizon, since for the first time in his experience, Syria was not ruled by an absentee governor. He planned to play Flaccus a visit during the spring of 35, but fate seemed to cherish a vacant post for Syria. Flaccus suddenly died before Pilate could make the trip. On the southern frontier, he stayed in close touch with Avilius Avilius Flaccus, the prefect of Egypt, where the people were astir about a resurrection story of another kind. After a heroic absence of many centuries, the wondrous phoenix had been sighted again. That remarkable bird, which supposedly lived hundreds of years, then died and virtually came to life again in one of its offspring, which also lived for centuries. On a more serious level, Flaccus warned Pilate of possible anti-Roman developments among the peoples of the Near East. On a scouting trip up the Nile, he discovered cach cach caches of contraband arms, 
which were to be used in a planned insurrection. He could not know what the situation was in Judea, but he advised Pilate to be on his guard. Yet, in pleasant contrast to the turmoil two years earlier, Judea seemed quite serene. In fact, Pilate had only one altercation with the Sanhedrin. It concerned a follower of Jesus named Stephen, whose brilliance in preaching the new faith had led to his trial for blasphemy before the Sanhedrin. His defense was so bold that he was pulled outside the walls of Jerusalem and stoned to death. When Pilate learned of it in Caesarea, he dispatched a caustic note to Caiaphas, which protested the stoning as contrary to Roman law and warned Vitell and warned against any such incidents in the future. Apologetically, the high priest promised he would try to prevent anything similar from happening again, though he did deserve the Sanhedrin's right to counteract the growing movement of the Nazarene. It was another of the items which reminded Pilate of that fateful Passover, but in this case, he merely felt vindicated. See, Procula, he contended, if I hadn't been in Jerusalem for that Passover, they would have stoned Jesus in precisely the same way as this Stephen and called it a mob action, which could not be prevented. Her answer was unbending, but you were in Jerusalem. A shock in Pilate's private life at Caesarea was what he called the spiritual defection of Cornelius. Responding to his wife's genuine Judaism, the centurion, centurion had had their first child, a boy, circumcised. And now he himself became a near convert to the Jewish faith. Indulging a traditional Roman prejudice, Pilate found it difficult to accept Cornelius' new religious allegiance. The centurion tried to explain that he was not a full proselyte. He just admired and shared the Jewish belief in one God. He claimed it was a magnificent substitute for the gods and goddesses of Roman paganism, which Pilate himself despised. But his interest in Judaism should in no way affect their close friendship, Cornelius insisted. But it did. With regret, Pilate noticed the beginnings of a change in their relationship. The old camaraderie had waned when Cornelius became a family man, which was understandable. But beyond this was the man's new religiosity. He attended worship in the local synagogue and soon began contributing to its support. He was even known to pay privately, pray privately on occasion. It was all very un-Roman, a bitter disappointment to Pilate. On the other hand, the Jewish community in Caesarea was pleased that a highly placed Roman in the provincial capital should follow their faith, even if he had not become a full proselyte. proselyte. This might well diminish future friction between Pilate and the Jews. But there was less chance of such abrasions now. The Sanhedrin, in full alarm at the growth of the Nazarene movement, had no time for any further tilts with Pilate. A general persecution against the sect was instituted. A house-by-house -house search for adherents of Jesus, who now fled Jerusalem and scattered across the country districts of Palestine. An ardent young student of Gamaliel named Saul was serving as a zealous inquisitor in ferreting out any who remained and packing them off to prison. Finally, only the disciples stayed in Jerusalem, and even they left periodically to spread the rapidly growing new faith. Did Annie leave? Oh. Just go out there. As soon as I'm done, I'll give this to you. Pilate had no time to plumb the theological niceties of the movement, nor did he concern himself with any of the journeying apostles. His total attention was now claimed by the arrival of the new governor of Syria, Lucius Vitellius, fresh from his consulship in Rome. He had a highly successful administration, and Tiberius placed such great confidence in Vitellus that he came armed with an extraordinary command to settle all affairs in the turbulent Roman East, not just in his appointed province of Syria. The Near East was in turmoil because the Parth Parthian Empire, that perennial dagger in Rome's eastern flank, was now making a renewed twist. Convinced that Tiberius was an unpopular old man who would do nothing to oppose him, King Artabanus III of Parthia moved to control Armenia, which was Rome's pro 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 protectorate. But by building dissatisfaction inside Parthia and allying with her enemies, Tiberius resisted. The capable, capable Vitellius was dispatched to carry out this policy, and his intrigues with leading Parthian, Parth, Parthian magnates to replace Artabanus so rattled the king that he was ready to talk terms. Vitellius marched his Syrian legions to the banks of the Euphrates and negotiated a settlement with Artabanus in the middle of a specially constructed bridge spanning the river. They agreed that Rome would recognize Artabanus in Parthia, while he would recognize Rome's control of Armenia. It was an astute diplomatic coup for Vitellius, who had triumphed without shedding a drop of Roman blood or spending a needless sester piece of money. And Pontius Pilate had watched it all happen with a good deal of chagrin, because Vitellius' assistant at the negotiations was none other than the sometime foe and friend Herod Antipas. Friends they might be ever since the reconciliation in Jerusalem, but rivals they would remain, and each had sought an opportunity to pay court to Vitellius upon his arrival in Syria. Antipas had won handsomely. 
Vitellius had taken the Tetrarch with him to the Euphrates Parley because he could speak Aramaic, the diplomatic language of the entire Near East, and Antipas made the most of his foray into international affairs. He entertained the negotiating parties at a sumptuous banquet in a pavilion pitched on the bridge itself, and immediately afterward wrote Tiberius a glowing account of the whole affair. While this annoyed Vitellius, whose official report to the princeps arrived later as old news, Antipas' stock was never higher in Rome. And that's the end of part two of chapter 21.